Good evening again. It doesn't seem that long since I was last here talking to you. This is a short talk about Apollo 13. It is not going to be a blow-by-blow -blow account of what happened, partly because I haven't got time. It was a 144-hour mission, and I've only got two hours or so to talk to you. And the other reason I'm not going to cover all of the detail is that Ron Howard and Tom Hanks have already done a very good job of telling you everything that happened. Here, I'm just going to outline the mission and tell you one or two things that you might not have known about how the Apollo 13 mission played out. So, let us start with the launch. Um, yes, it launched like all of the others, uh, other than Apollo 9, which stayed in Earth orbit. So the Saturn V launched Apollos 8, 10, 11, and 12, and Apollo 13 launched pretty much the same way. Minor problems, as you might remember from the film, in terms of the Saturn V's main engine shutting down a little bit early, but basically everything went off to a T and everything was fine. The astronauts, uh, the original crew, Ken Mattingly, the command module pilot, uh, Jim Lovell, the commander, and Fred Hayes, the lunar module pilot. And uh, again, I'm probably telling you things you already know. At the last minute, because of exposure to German measles from the backup crew, specifically Charlie Duke, uh, Ken Mattingly wasn't immune to German measles, so he had to be dropped. Uh, for those that don't recognize the face, think Gary Sinise, and then you'll know who I'm talking about. He gets dropped from the crew and replaced with Jack Swigert. And so we have three brave astronauts that get hurtled to the moon. Now, of course, the story of Apollo 13 and what I regard as the heroic efforts of mission controllers to bring the three astronauts back to safety was immortalized in the Ron Howard film of 1995. Ron Howard, the director, Tom Hanks, et al. being the, uh, the main actors. Have people seen the film? Yeah, yeah. I, I figured most people would have seen the film, perhaps not everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So Hollywood needed some, um, some characters to play Lovell, Hayes, and, uh, and Swigert. Uh, and Lovell, uh, sorry, uh, Hollywood needed astronauts. So they picked three characters. And the three characters they picked were... <coughs> okay, they decided not to go with that. They decided to go with a different set of actors. And Jack Swigert was played by Kevin Bacon. Jim Lovell played by Tom Hanks and Fred Hayes, played by Bill Paxton. One thing I love about the actual film is that most of the zero-G scenes were filmed in zero-G. That was a very brave thing for Ron Howard to decide to do. Rather than just get people on wires or use CGI, he basically took the actors and the film crew up in the Vomit Comet, did parabolic arcs, and got them weightless for a short length of time, and did that over and over again in order to film the zero-G scenes. As a result, I believe, though I can't easily verify it, I believe that these actors, and possibly the film crew as well, have actually clocked up more zero-G hours than virtually every other astronaut in existence. Most astronauts have one or two trips in the Vomit Comet and spend most of their time training in water, in big water tanks. You've probably seen them do this for, for various spacewalks, etc., especially in the ISS. The cheapest way of training an astronaut in zero-G is to put them in water. The, the Vomit Comet is just the ultimate way of making sure that you can stand zero-G. But these guys have to go up time and time and time again, filming possibly just a few seconds worth of footage, and then another few seconds, and then another few seconds. And I'm not sure how many hours they clocked up, but I believe they are the most experienced zero-G people in existence. I thought that was very interesting, but I find it very difficult to actually pin down the number of hours. So again, reality and Hollywood. We know that the Apollo 13 mission unfolded a particular way, and we know that it was immortalized by Hollywood, but I hadn't appreciated that it was also immortalized in Lego. Um, and yes, you can buy an Apollo 13, or I believe you can buy an Apollo 13 kit. I'm not sure if it's publicly available or whether it was just manufactured as a prototype. But what we have here is the full Apollo 13 experience. We have the mission controllers there at their mission control desk. Big red telephone, presumably for the president. <laughs> a checklist, uh, I think a microphone, and of course a cup of coffee. I mean, you can't exist without the coffee. 
and we have three representative mission controllers. We have the rather stern-looking Gene Krantz there, the flight director. We have a flight dynamics officer, Fido, and we have an aeronautical engineer, who seems to be sweating prof profusely, presumably due to the effort of actually trying to figure out what the hell happened in the accident and how we get our brave astronauts home again. So Krantz looks very odd with his very stern, gaunt-looking face, but uh, OK, that's fine. Uh, and of course, as well as the mission controllers, the Apollo 13 kit also includes our heroic astronauts. In the middle there, the commander, Jim Lovell, looking actually quite happy. On the right, we have lunar module pilot Hayes, looking a little bit less happy. Hayes was actually ill for a lot of the flight, especially on the way home. And on the left-hand side, the command and service module pilot, uh, Swiger, looking distinctly grisly. I presume it was because it was he that flicked the switch that actually produced the explosion that actually produced the disaster. So perhaps that's why they decided to put him with that rather stern-looking face there. Lovell seems to be enjoying himself, though. Regardless of what else is happening, that seems to be going quite well. There's the uh, Apollo 13 uh, spacecraft. Um, not Lego's best. It's not the most detailed kit. But the command and service module, you can see before the accident, everything is fine. And after the accident, the entire side is blown off. And you can start to see some of the inner workings of the, of the service module there. I say not Lego's finest hour in terms of the actual detail in the lunar module. For those that like Lego, there's far better kits around where you can get. In this case, this is the Apollo 11 anniversary edition of the Lego kit. You can tell it's the anniversary edition because they've actually included gold bricks for some of the gold foil around the descent stage of the lunar module and a couple of astronauts on the surface of the moon there. So I thought it was interesting that Lego immortalized it, and I'm going to use the Lego figures to make some of the illustrations here. One or two abbreviations I'm going to use. So that is the Apollo spacecraft in, in its entirety after it has left or been pushed out by the Saturn V, stages one, two, and three, getting it on its way to the moon. And we have the service module, everything from the command module heat shield backwards, the command module in the middle, and then the lunar module uh, from the docking hatch onwards. And the abbreviations I'm going to use from time to time and in the handout, which will be available shortly, the standard abbreviations are SM for the service module. Remember, not occupied by any astronauts, purely the services to provide everything the astronauts need to keep them alive. The astronauts in the living space in the command module, or CM, or in the lunar module, uh, the LM. It's often referred to as the LEM simply because its old name used to be the LEM, and so it got called LEM. It used to be called the lunar excursion module until they changed its name just to the lunar module. And every once in a while, we need to refer to these two together, the command module where the astronauts uh, exist for some of the time and the service module that keeps them alive. When they're combined, they're often referred to as the CSM, the command and service module. So those are the abbreviations that will crop up from time to time, especially in the titles and, and occasionally in the text. So I think people probably are familiar with the Apollo missions, but I'll just, in, in Lego speak, take you through how it should have happened. In other words, what was supposed to happen in Apollo 13? What was supposed to happen is that our intrepid heroes are in the uh, CSM, they're in the command and service module, attached to the lunar module, on their way to the, uh, on the moon. So they, they get everything sorted out in Earth orbit, and then the third stage of the Saturn V sends them on their way to the moon. So they happily travel for about three days on their way to the moon. Apollo 13 was supposed to land ooh, somewhere around here, a little bit south of the large crater Copernicus, the uh, Framoro Highlands. Uh, I'm not going to show it landing there. I'm just going to schematically tell you, roughly speaking, what happened. When they arrived at the moon, they went into orbit, and our three intrepid heroes, uh, who uh, spent most of their time in the command module, two of them would then transfer into the lunar module through the docking hatch uh, there. Then they would seal off and break the connection, and the lunar module would then make its hopefully controlled descent onto the surface of the moon and our two heroes can then get out of the lunar module and go a-roaming. OK, they didn't land at the North Pole. That is just schematic. They actually landed down here somewhere. So after an EVA or two, um, and kicking the dust, and planting the flag, and saluting, and doing all those things that astronauts are supposed to do when they're on the moon, 
um, they would have then um, launched back up to rendezvous with the command and service module. The descent module stays put, and the uh, explosive bolts separate the ascent module from the descent module, and the ascent module goes back up to rendezvous with the command and service module. The descent module stays on the surface of the moon. That's important for what comes a little bit later. So we now have our two um, astronauts return from the surface of the moon, so they then go back into the command module and rejoin the lonely command module pilot. The ascent stage of the lunar module now, now has no purpose whatsoever, and there's no point in taking it back to Earth. It's a very fragile thing. It wouldn't survive re-entry. So there's no point in spending fuel bringing it back to Earth, so you may as well ditch it. In the case of Apollo 10, they put it into orbit around the sun. In later missions, they crash the ascent module back into the surface of the moon to avoid having too much litter uh, dotted around the moon orbit. So the ascent stage gets effectively thrown away. The descent stage stays on the moon, and our three astronauts in the command module then make their three-day journey back to Earth. Hum, 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 hum. OK, it's a long journey. Three days later, where hopefully nothing much happens, they arrive back at Earth. The service module has been providing them with oxygen and water and power for the last week or so. And again, as they approach Earth, they don't go into Earth orbit. They come slamming straight into the Earth's atmosphere. Before they hit the Earth's atmosphere, they want to expose the heat shield. They get rid of the service module, which again has no uh, purpose anymore. The service module comes away, burns up in the Earth's atmosphere. That leaves our three astronauts in the command module. The Heat shield is now exposed, and if they get their sums right, they come hurtling in the Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles an hour, or whatever it happens to be, and in they come, and then they splash down in the ocean, and whoop, there's the splash, there you go. So um, we're, that, that's showing the Indian Ocean, forget that, they come down in the Pacific Ocean somewhere. So that's what was supposed to happen. That's essentially what happened on every other Apollo mission. Different landing site, but effectively the same idea. But of course, in Apollo 13, something happened rather differently. What actually happened was everything was pretty much OK for the first two days, roughly speaking. The critical point was 55 hours into the mission. So for the first 48 hours plus, everything went pretty much to schedule. They pulled away from Earth. They intended to coast for about three days to get to the moon. But after two days, they were still one day away from the moon. That's when we had the bang, Houston, we've had a problem. Not what Tom Hanks said. Tom Hanks said, Houston, we have a problem, because that sounds better than what was actually said which was, Houston, we've had a problem. It's only a small change in the tense of the verb, but Hollywood thought we have a problem sounded better, even though they knew damn well that's not what anybody said. Swigert said, we've had a problem. Houston said, uh, say again, please, because they didn't quite hear it. And then Lovell reiterated, Houston, we've had a problem. Hollywood changed it slightly. So it's one of those misquotes, a bit like Beam Me Up Scotty from the original Star Trek series. He never actually said that. So there was a bang, and uh, the side, uh, what actually happened was uh, uh, an oxygen tank blew up. They couldn't see this at the time. I'm cheating on the chronology, because that picture doesn't come until later, but it shows you what actually happened. What actually happened inside was one of the oxygen tanks exploded because of faulty wiring. I'm not going to go through the detail of exactly why it was faulty. Ask later if you're interested in exactly what the problem was. But there was faulty wiring when the cryotanks were, st the cryo -tanks were stirred because the oxygen tends to stratify if left alone. The engines would work perfectly well without stirring up the oxygen or hydrogen in the tanks. But in order to tell exactly what the level is, the technicians down in mission control prefer, prefer that the tanks are stirred up to get a better indication of the level. So Swigert was asked to stir the cryo tanks. The insulation on the fan that does the stirring was faulty. It produced a short. It produced, effectively, a burning of what should be the insulation of the wires. It's in the oxygen tank, which means it's a fire that's fed with pure oxygen. The pressures went up enormously, and it blew the side panel off, damaged the oxygen tank, took out the other oxygen tank, and took out the fuel cells, effectively. The fuel cells combine fuel and oxygen and produce electricity and water. 
So by losing the oxygen and losing the fuel tank, uh, the fuel cells, you lose oxygen, you lose water, you lose power. The three absolutely crucial things you need to keep you alive. So it was bad news. It took them a while to figure out what was going on. I'm not going to go through the details because, again, the dramatization of the film showing you what happened in subsequent hours, the uh, Ron Howard film is very close to the truth of what actually happened. Okay, it's a two-hour film that doesn't tell you everything, so with a bit of um, artistic license in there, it's a very accurate dramatization of how the rescue went. So we couldn't see that at the time, but that's actually the damage that was done. From the command module, there's no way of looking back to see what the damage is with the service module. But they weren't sure whether or not they knew damage was done here because of all their telemetry readings. What they couldn't tell is whether or not the engine had been affected. Is it safe to fire the engine knowing you've had an explosion in the back of your vehicle? So we've got the three people in the command module. It's gone bang and they need to think about how they're going to get home. Without oxygen, without power, without water, everybody realized that they would have to use the lunar module as a lifeboat. A lifeboat. The lunar module still has power, it still has its batteries, and so they can try and conserve power, try and conserve water, and if they don't breathe too heavily and do too much exercise, maybe the oxygen they've got will last. Remember, the lunar module is designed as an independent spacecraft, so it has its own supplies of electrical power, oxygen, etc. They had some problems with CO2, which again I won't go through. The astronauts spent most of their time in the lifeboat, the lunar module, and they had to make sure the CO2 was removed because the lunar module was designed for two people, not designed for three. It's designed to take two people to the moon and bring them back again. It's not designed to house three people for quite a few days. So they had to make, had to make improvisations with the CO2 scrubbers. Interestingly, there were contingency plans for what would happen if we make it to the moon but in order to get back again, what happens if something goes wrong with the service module? In other words, they had thought of something very similar to the Apollo 13 contingency. They had figured out how do we survive a three-day journey home. In fact, one of the astronauts that thought about the contingency plans was Swigert. So you have a man sitting in the pilot seat who knows precisely what can and can't be done. In a sense, that was a stroke of luck. This guy is just the guy you want to be sitting in that seat. No disrespect to Matt Mattingly, who's sitting on the ground, not suffering from German measles. So they had figured how they get home in a three-day flight, but they are two days out. What do you do? Do you turn around and fire this main engine and get home as quickly as possible? There's no indication whether or not that engine is working or not. You know you've had an accident. You know fuel cells are damaged. You know oxygen is damaged. Is it safe to fire that engine? That's the only engine powerful enough to turn the spacecraft around and come straight back to Earth again. They figured that was not the sensible thing to do. If they're two days out, one option is to coast one day to the moon and then spend three days coming back again. So it's not quite the same as the contingency plan because the contingency was how do we keep these people alive for three days? Now they've got to keep three people alive for four days. And that's touch and go when they've lost so much of their power and oxygen. So the decision was made, we're not going to turn around and fly home. We're going to continue, loop around the, the, uh, the backside of the moon, fire the lunar module engine, not the command module, uh, not the service module engine, and then hopefully survive another three days coming home. So they carried on, got to the moon, went round the moon, had a look at the moon while they were there, but didn't go into orbit and basically came straight back home again. So we have the problem of how we're going to survive. We've got to ration the oxygen, ration the water, ration the electrical power. So the temperatures plummeted. Arguably, they might have made a mistake in that they decided in order to try and get some sleep, they closed the blinds on the windows to darken the inside of the spacecraft to make it easier to sleep. But when you haven't got power powering all the electrical equipment inside the spacecraft, if you stop sunlight coming in, the temperature drops even faster. Generally speaking, you don't need to heat a spacecraft. You need to cool it because you're powering the various instruments, and that is enough to keep the spacecraft warm. If anything, you need to try and cool it by radiating excess heat. 
but if there's no equipment on, because they've effectively powered down everything, but they, what they actually needed to keep them alive, blocking out the windows and stopping sunlight coming in perhaps wasn't the best idea. So the temperature actually fell faster than they would have liked, and that's why they had a very uncomfortable four days in a very cold capsule coming back. Strictly rationed water, very cold, very difficult to sleep. But ultimately, thanks to the ingenuity of mission control, they figured out how to ration the oxygen, the water, and the power such that they could actually come back to Earth and survive. So the view through the window when they eventually made it back to Earth some days later uh, must have been very welcome. Again, I'm not going to talk about mid-course corrections and the other bits of excitement that you would get in the Apollo 13 movie. I'm sure that's going to be shown again in April when we have the 50th anniversary come round again. So I'm sure they were delighted when they looked out of their window, and this is, I think, one of the last pictures they took of Earth before they were getting to the point of getting ready to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. So finally, they come home. Three astronauts are still in the lunar module. Uh, and so four uncomfortable days later, they finally get to within a few hours of Earth, and they realize they are going to make it by the looks of it. As long as the command module survives, as long as the command module heat shield wasn't damaged in the explosion, they weren't sure exactly where the explosion was, and they couldn't tell whether or not the heat shield was damaged. But there's nothing you can do about it, so they just crossed their fingers. So they were a few hours away, hoping that the heat shield will last. It looks like the power's lasting. It looks like they've survived, and they only have a few hours until they come back to Earth. So they transfer back to the command module and power it up again. Again, a very dramatic part, as you see in the film, where having been dead for four days, what happens when you switch it back on again, especially as it's so cold and water has condensed all over the electrical uh, switches? Are you sure that when you power back up, you don't get a short and <laughs> possibly even another fire? So the astronauts are now back in the command module. The service module was doing very little for them, so you may as well get rid of that. And this is the point at which they detached the service module, and this is the point at which they actually took the photo that I showed earlier by cheating. You can see there's obviously no uh, command module there. That thing sticking up is the conduit that carries all of the power and water and everything else into the command module when they're attached together. To jettison the service module, a guillotine cuts all of those connections and allows the two to separate. And this was the first time they got a glimpse of the amount of damage caused by the explosion of the oxygen tank. They couldn't exactly tell how much damage it had done, but it was clear the damage came almost to the point to the back of the service module where the service uh, propulsion system would have provided power had they had the, uh, um, taken the chance of actually trying to power that up. So perhaps it was a good decision not to try and power that up. So now they're in a position of sitting in the command module. It's a rather odd configuration. No Apollo had ever been in this configuration before. We've got the crew in the command module. The service module has gone, and you're still drawing power from the lunar module. They kept the lunar module connected for as long as possible. The service module was ditched about six hours before they hit the atmosphere. They kept the lunar module because they were still drawing power, and they wanted to keep the command module batteries in reserve because that is what was going to deploy the chutes when they get into the Earth's atmosphere. They didn't want to bleed those dry and find that they then did, ended up hurtling to Earth uh, without their parachutes. So they kept the uh, batteries within the lunar module for their last-minute re-entry, used as much of the lunar module power as they could until something like an hour before hitting the atmosphere. At that point, they jettisoned uh, the lunar module. Goodbye, Aquarius. We thank you. I'll tell you what happened to Aquarius in just another slide or two. So now our astronauts are in the command module, and now they can do what they should have done in the first place and simply land with the three astronauts in the command module and splash down in the Pacific Ocean. Splash again. So again, the picture shows the Indian Ocean. That's just schematic. And of course, as we all know, history tells us they arrived safely. They didn't have many hours to spare, but because of all the efforts of trying to ration and uh, improvise everything that happened over those four days, they arrived back in Earth with a little bit of oxygen and water, etc., to spare, but not much. 
Failure is not an option. Just like Houston, we have a problem. Failure is not an option was not quoted by Kranz. It was quoted by Ed Harris. Hollywood thought, that's a wonderful quote. What was said at the time is, if ever we have a problem, we look at all the options, say the mission controllers. We look at all the options, and failure isn't one of them. Hollywood picked that up, Ron Howard picked that up and thought, fantastic, but way too long. We want something shorter. We don't want to, we're going to look at all the options, but failure isn't one of them. That's not snappy enough. So they came up with, failure is not an option. And that's what Ed Harris, playing Green, uh, Gene Krantz, said in the film. But it's such a fantastic quote, although Gene Krantz didn't say it, he made it the title of his autobiography, because everybody expected him to say it. It's one of those things like Beam Me Up Scotty. Everybody thought he said it, and therefore, in a sense, he had to put it on the cover of his book. What he said was, it, uh, he put it as his autobiography title, because it did sum up so succinctly the attitude of everybody in mission control at the time. If anybody's not read the book, highly recommend it. It's one of the best books I've uh, read by uh, Krantz. He writes really well, and it's a really interesting story as to how he became the flight director of Apollo 11, Apollo 13, etc. So highly recommend it. So another misquote, but it's one of those misquotes that everybody thinks real, and so it's gone into history as one of the things that were never said, but 99% of the people around assume it was. The command module, whose call sign was Odyssey, we've just said, splashed down safely in the Earth with its three occupants. Something you might not know about the rest of the Apollo hardware is the third stage of the Saturn V rocket, after it has sent the Apollo spacecraft on its way to the moon, some two days before the accident actually happened, what they said was that they wanted that part of the Saturn V to do one last job, and its last job was to smash into the moon. The previous Apollo missions, of course, had left seismometers on the moon. The Apollo 12 astronauts, some four months, five months earlier, had left a seismometer sitting on the moon. And so what they did was put the third stage of the Saturn V on a slightly different trajectory so that the, um, it wouldn't get in the way of the command and service module and the lunar module. They sent the rocket crashing into the moon. Previous Apollo missions, what did they do with the rocket? They put it in orbit around the sun. In other words, they get it out of harm's way by firing it and put it into a solar orbit, a heliocentric orbit. In fact, I think it was the Apollo 12 third stage that was actually rediscovered um, 30 years later. Somebody discovered an asteroid, and they thought, no, that doesn't look right for an asteroid. Let's take its spectrum. What does its spectrum indicate it's made of? It's not made of rock. It's made of aluminium, white paint, and black paint. That screams at you that it's a Saturn V. They basically rediscovered the third stage of the Saturn V and thought it was an asteroid. Turns out not. But the, uh, the, the Apollo 13 and all subsequent Apollos used the rocket to crash into the moon because it makes a very nice impact. You know how fast it's going, and therefore you know how much energy has slammed into the moon, and therefore you can calibrate your seismometers. The Apollo 12 seismometers went not quite off scale, indicating that the moon was ringing like a bell after being hit by the third stage of the Saturn V. So Apollo actually did something useful, as well as rescue the non-existent lunar landing. They actually did something useful by calibrating uh, the seismometers that were on the surface of the moon. What happened to Aquarius? The lunar module, of course, is a very fragile thing. It's not designed to come into the Earth's atmosphere, just like the service module isn't. The lunar module is even more fragile. The command module has got a heat shield, so that's designed to bring the astronauts home safely. But Aquarius, the lunar module, was jettisoned and burnt up in the Earth's atmosphere. However, they had to make sure it came down where they wanted it to come down. They would not leave anything to chance, which is why they disengaged a little bit earlier than re-entry, about an hour earlier, and they left some air inside the airlock between the command module and the lunar module, so that when they disengaged, basically the air pushed them apart, and it pushed the lunar module in such a way that they didn't come down together. The lunar module was placed in a particular trajectory to bring it down into the deepest part of the South Pacific. They wanted the lunar module to end up in the Tonga Trench. 
why are you so fussed about where it comes down? Because it's a lunar module, it's very fragile, we know it will just crumble. Well, actually, they figured that there might be two components that survive re-entry. One component might be part of the engine. The engines are very robust and designed to take very high temperatures. So it might be that part of the engine would actually survive re-entry. But it wasn't that that they were worried about. Remember I said the descent stage stays on the surface of the moon under normal conditions. The descent stage does not come back to Earth. And that matters because the descent stage has one very important component, which often doesn't get talked about. And here in Apollo 12, we see Alan Bean taking out the plutonium from the descent stage of the lunar module because in the descent stage, there's a plutonium um, cask, as it were, which goes into this device, which is a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. It's what powers all of the equipment sitting on the surface of the moon. It's not all solar powered. Basically, they have a plutonium um, RTG, it's called there, radioisotope thermoelectric generator, that powers the experiments that they leave and hopefully powers them for a few years so that they can get valuable data. So the descent stage is supposed to stay on the moon and that plutonium is supposed to stay in the RTG, but in Apollo 13, they brought it back to Earth and they do not want that landing anywhere sensitive. So they basically wanted to put the lunar module into the deepest trench in the South Pacific, the Tonga Trench, and hopefully they figured that would be safe enough. The cask that the plutonium is in should withstand re-entry. It's designed to effectively, and that plutonium should be contained and still sitting at the bottom of the ocean somewhere at about 10,000 meters depth or thereabouts. So Apollo 13 was a success, and we can tell because Tom Hanks, having arrived back on Earth, is then congratulated by none other than Jim Lovell, yes, who plays the captain of the USS Iwo Jima. Um, he plays a cameo and effectively congratulates himself, which is a really weird situation, but there you go. Um, apparently, they weren't really aware of the amount of publicity that Apollo 13 was generating. Mission Control was feeding the news, saying everybody in the world is saying prayers for your safe return, but it wasn't until they read the newspapers when they got home. Here they are, I think, on the, on the Iwo Jima, or maybe heading back to um, uh, Hawaii. It's only when they started reading the newspapers, they realized just how much the near disaster had galvanized, essentially, everybody in the world. And that was interesting that Lovell was rather bemused by what had happened. I think his quote at the end of the week was something like, well, I can't say it hasn't been an interesting week. I mean, that is the master of understatement of anybody who says that after six days of what they went through, basically. One final point, because it's not yet 8 o'clock, but it will be eventually. <laughs> who made what? Um, the Saturn V was made by lots of people. Boeing made the first stage. Uh, North American made the second stage. Uh, McDonald made the third stage. And the Apollo spacecraft itself, the command and service modules, were made by a different company to the lunar module. Uh, the command and service modules were made by North American Aviation, later renamed to North American Rockwell. And the lunar module was made by Grumman Aircraft Corporation, later renamed Grumman Aerospace. So apart from a slight change of name, Grumman made the lunar module, North American made the command and service module. Why does this matter? Well, everybody wanted to get the astronauts back safely. Fine. But as soon as it was realized that they were safe, then some individuals had a little bit of a laugh. Nobody will do that whilst they're in peril, but once they're safe, the people at Grumman basically said, well, you could argue that Apollo 13 was a near disaster and was saved by all of the heroes in mission control. Alternatively, you can say because this thing blew up and they ended up using the lunar module as a lifeboat, actually, Grumman saved North American. North American had a fault, Grumman saved the day. So the people at Grumman said, yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll send them an invoice. <laughs> so Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation requisition via Houston, via the USS Iwo Jima, where they knew that basically they had landed. OK, we are going to bill you. Um, and we are going to bill North American from Grumman. And we are going to charge you 
well, what are we going to charge you? We're going to charge you a towing bill. Four dollars for the first mile, one dollar for each additional mile. And basically, they had to go out to the moon and back again, so it was about 400,000 miles of towing. So the bill is 400,004, because of that first mile, uh, 400,004 dollars being charged by Grumman to, um, to uh, North American for basically getting them home by towing them along with their engine. They also charged them a battery charge using the customer's own jump cables. Um, the jump cables ran from the command module to the lunar module to make sure power could go where they needed it, even though those batteries were dying and those batteries were good. So there was a battery charge as well. They also charged them for oxygen because they were using the lunar module's oxygen supplies and the lunar module's water supplies. But what I liked was the item number five, sorry, item number four, we are going to charge you accommodation. Now, the, we're going to charge you because we've got sleeping accommodation for two. The lunar module's designed for two, no problem. Um, you have used sleeping accommodation for two people. Uh, no TV. <coughs> Air conditioned, yes. Uh, with radio, um, but no TV. And with a view. Um, so this particular room, fantastic view. You can't argue with that. How much are we going to charge you for that? Well, that's part of the deal because it was supposed to do that. The lunar module was supposed to take two people, no TV, air conditioning, with a view. Therefore, that's already built into the Apollo program, so Grumman is not going to charge you for that. But there weren't two people in the lunar module. There were three people. So, additional guest in room, <laughs> charged at $8 a night. So, apart from the $400,000 towing fee, there's an additional charge of $32, $8 a night, for the extra guest that was not scheduled to be in the lunar module for those four nights. And then they charge for water, and they give them a bit of a discount uh, because they're a known customer. Uh, and there's no taxes applicable because it's a government contract, so that's fine. So basically, this, was, this invoice was generated by not the head of Grumman. This was generated by the grunts further down. Apparently, the head of Grumman wasn't too pleased about this. It went from the workers in one to the workers in another, and it bypassed completely the finance section and the heads of the two corporations. So I don't think the head of Grumman or the head of North American were very pleased with this, but I thought it showed a wonderful sense of humor and possibly an indication of the relief that everything worked out in the end, and therefore we can make a joke like that. I thought that was a, a wonderful... Something you may or may not be interested in is when Odyssey came back, that's what it looked like. That's Odyssey being recovered on the USS Iwo Jima. In common with just about every other command module, it comes out of the ocean looking like that because a lot of the thermal shielding, this Kapton thermal coating, gets ripped away on re-entry. Not uniformly, because the command module comes in at an angle, and so one side gets scoured, and the other not so much. But there's always this capped on sort of goldish colored um, leaf over the outside. What they do is, of course, um, they, they take it, they clean it up, and ultimately, the command module ends up in a museum somewhere. Apollo 10 ends up in the Science Museum in London. Apollo 13 command module ended up in Kansas, I think. But basically, they tidy up and take and strip all of this rather messy-looking gold foil off the outside. Some of it got thrown away. Some of it was given to technicians. Some of it ended up in a museum. And the museum, given it was their property, decided to cut up the foil into small pieces and sell it. So there is a little piece of Odyssey. That is my little piece of Apollo 13, a tiny, tiny, tiny part of this that was on the outside of the command module. You can buy it from museums with a certificate of authenticity. You can buy it on eBay, and you'll probably get rubbish. But if you buy it from a reputable museum, you can be sure that that is what a lot of people have did. Many square centimeters have been given to museums, and that gives you many square millimeters that you can sell to gullible people like me who will gladly pay a few dollars to buy a piece of history. I'll gladly show it to you. I am not going to take it out of its box. Okay. So that is a piece of Odyssey. Four years ago, in the 45th anniversary of Apollo 13, they all came together. Uh, Charlie Duke at the rostrum there, Jim Lovell,
Fred Hayes, uh, Gene Krantz, who have we got here? Um, we've got uh, Lunny, another flight controller. We've got, uh, what is it, uh, Jerry Griffin. We've got uh, Vance Brand, uh, Jack Luzma, and Joe Kerwin. These three were Capcoms, capsule communicators during Apollo 13. These three were flight directors. And we've got Hayes and Lovell. Unfortunately, Swigert died some years after Apollo 13 due to cancer. He, he was intending to go into the US Congress, but unfortunately died before that happened. So effectively, this is all the key players, other than Swigert, joining together for the 45th anniversary of Apollo 13 in, uh, in 2015. I am not sure what they are going to do in 2020. I would imagine in a few months' time, when the 50th anniversary comes around, Maybe they will do something similar. I'm not sure since then if any of these other individuals have died or not. They are, of course, all getting rather old, and it won't be long before we don't have people who can actually remember what happened because they were there rather than because when they were young they saw it on TV. So it was interesting that we have this arrangement of these individuals who, one way or another, were responsible for getting the astronauts home. So, an incredible story, and I hope you enjoyed my take on it.